we know what this segment of our service is all about. Irene, we're so proud of you. You know, if I were to ask you um, who won the Oscar last year for best actor, would you know? Or if I ask you who was the most valuable player in baseball last year, would you know? If you're like me, you wouldn't know. Unfortunately, in our society, we tend to idolize those who are rich and or famous. But by human nature, we seem to remember those people who make an impact in our lives. Those people who make us feel good. Those people who make us feel happy. You know, if I were to ask you, who is your favorite teacher? I'm sure most of you would know. I know my favorite teacher was my third grade teacher. That was about 150 years ago. <laughs> Mrs. Smith taught me how to read. I didn't know how to read before I got in the third grade. My parents thought I was the dumbest child they ever had. <laughs> I think my sisters probably still subscribe to that idea. But she taught me how to read. She had an impact. And that's what Irene has done for this congregation today. She was born in the small town of Shafter in Kern County. She and Archie were married in Kern County. They had three children, all born in Bakersfield. Uh, they have eight grandchildren and 12 great-grandchildren and four great-great-grandchildren. So she's got, got quite a legacy there. She has given her love to this congregation for over 60 years. She and Archie moved here in 1961 to Tulare, and she embraced her role as a servant for the church immediately. Now Darlene, her daughter, was only 18 months of age when she first came to Tulare. And Darlene was in her class. Irene taught the one and two year old classes for over 30 years. But Irene wasn't just a great and wonderful teacher. She did many other things that a, a true servant of Christ does. She visited the sick. She took food to the sick. She visited those in the hospital. She sewed for people. She did all of the things that a good Christian servant could do. And we're just so very proud of you, Irene, for that. I want to direct your minds for a few minutes to a Acts, the ninth chapter. There's a few verses in there about a, another woman who was a great servant in the faith. Her name, name was Dorcas. And the Holy Spirit felt it important enough for whatever reason to even tell us what her name meant. Her name meant deer or gazelle. But we know very, very little about Dorcas. We don't know how old she was, whether she was married, whether she was rich, or whether she was poor. But one thing we do know is that Dorcas always did good things for people. She always did good things for people. And Dorcas's name has gone down in history, 
No, we don't remember who the Oscar winner was. The Dorcas's name will never pass away because her name is written in God's word. Irene, we will never forget you. You're going to be moving to Napomo to live with your daughter and son-in-law, Mark and Darlene Jones. We will miss you. Hopefully you'll miss us. <laughs> but just know that when you want to come back, we're going to leave the light on for you. And I'd like to leave you with one scripture. It's found in John, the 14th chapter. By the way, before I read this, Irene's name in Greek means peace. And in John 14, Jesus said just before he went to the cross, he spoke to his disciples, comforting them. He says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Irene, we will always remember you. Thank you for being the person that you were. I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I, I see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. We love And we love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I love you with the love of the Lord. I see in you the glory of my King. And I love you with the love of the Lord. Something uh, I always remember about Irene is that she encouraged the ladies, uh, mostly by example. She, uh, I don't know where she got the idea. Irene, it'd be interesting to find out where you got the idea for the teddy bear ministry. But it was a, a project where they had, uh, let's see, what was it? I've got it listed here. People who cut the teddy bears out, 
people who sewed them together, other people who stuffed them, and then they delivered them in the quantity of 10,000 or more. 10,000 to the Tulare District Hospital. And they were given to little kids in the hospital. And I think they carry some in the ambulances around town. And they, when there were children involved in an accident, the ambulance operators had these teddy bears from the church, from the ladies of the Church of Christ. And Irene spearheaded that ministry for 10 years. But is that written down here? But the, I, mean, I just can't imagine the ladies of this congregation sewing 10,000 teddy bears giving those out to little kids that were in troubles. Uh, the Advanced Register wrote an article about that, showed a picture of the ladies in the project there, and uh, it was kind of a neat thing, glorifying God with the hands and uh, just sewing something with the tip of their fingers, sewing those little teddy bears together. For many years, Irene uh, worked with um, Diane Yamamoto and other people leading a group that they call the Encouragers. And that was just the senior saints or the older members of the congregation. And uh, Irene, were you the one that coined that phrase, Encouragers? I think you were. Uh, but uh, it was a, a term for the older people getting together and serving to encourage other people. And uh, at one point, uh, in fact, a, a number of times, they, they had uh, dinners for the senior saints. And uh, Irene led these things and encouraged these things and inspired these programs. And uh, the uh, young people dressed in uh, d uh, light white shirts and dark skirts or pants and served the people. So it brought the two generations together, gave the young people a, a feeling of involvement and gave the old people, old people like me, a feeling of uh, appreciation. I had some notes here, and I was going to do my best not to read these word for word, but I want to make sure that uh, I'm used to preaching from an outline, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. Okay, yeah, there was another thing. Irene personally made uh, gifts for grandparents to uh, recognize them on Grandparents Day. Irene, we've slipped up on that. They haven't done that here lately. We need to remember the encouragement from Irene and encourage grandparents. How many of you are, you know, we're almost all grandparents in here, it seems like. But Irene, uh, we just wanted to put a few words together to show you that we appreciate you. Thank you and God bless. She probably does have lots of stars in her crown. And she's probably as good as everything that's been said about her. But she's just a lady. And ladies who love men <clears throat> and have kids get broken hearts from time to time. Irene loved her family. When, when Ruthie and I got here, Mark and Darlene were living in Reno. Uh, they had a baby boy named Landon. Ruthie and I had a baby boy named Landon. And when I picked up the grandkids this morning, I asked our Landon, I said, you wanna come talk? about your teacher. And he smiled and he said, I could. <laughs> I said, I know you could. Everybody who knows Irene can talk about Irene. What an influence she's had. But I just wanted you to know she loved those kids like moms, like moms get broken hearts. 
And so all of the good things that have been mentioned, we held hands and cried and prayed. She prayed with me about my kids. I prayed with her about her kids and grandkids. All that Irene is and does comes out of that love. And those periods of time in her life when her heart was breaking, she could have easily given up, tossed up her hands, chucked the whole deal. But instead, she focused all of that love, all of that faith into doing good things and serving others, most of which has been mentioned. You ask somebody in Tulare what they know about our church. And they will tell you that I know your church is a praying church because we have often prayed for community issues. But most of all, I also know you guys eat really good. <laughs> I am not a fan of Tough Lux, have never been a fan of Tough Lux, probably will not ever be a fan. I think that stems from some terrible childhood disaster that I blocked out of my memory, but it, um, but I go, I, I go from time to time to fellowship. And what I've noticed, and I don't know how it's done, I, I, I have watched, I've watched Ruthie bake for 50 years, and when she takes things out of the oven, it's all there. But when Irene takes something out of the oven, from a, my observations across the way, is that just three quarters of it comes out. <laughs> because by the time you get to go to the dessert table, a quarter of that is missing already. And that is a peculiar phenomenon that happens here that I'm not saying that those ladies that work in the kitchen eat that first. Uh, but I think maybe there's strong evidence to support that. And as you watch and observe, and the prayer is gone, and folks are in line for food. The line is long, and everybody's eager to eat dinner. And there's a small group that gets up and goes the opposite way. I think they need to repent, but it, uh, because they go get dessert first. Janice, and it, um, and I, um, they just do not want to miss any of Irene's cobbler. We're going to have to found a cobbler of the month club or something, so Irene comes and so these ladies don't have withdrawal. Irene has been such an encourager. But she has such a great servant heart. At the expense of when it was broken, she had such a great servant heart. 
And she is an example to all of us to how to survive and deal through faith in the Lord and a tremendous Christian work ethic not to let things get you down no matter what be faithful uh, and boy she has we can't remember a time when she hasn't she taught kids and then she taught their kids and that amazes me she is such an encourager. She is such a servant. It's been said she's a facilitator, a leader, a caregiver, a great cook, a great sister in Christ. Every one of those qualities describe her. Any one of them would be a great compliment. But to have all those bundled up in a great smile, like the Energizer Bunny, is pretty amazing. Irene is truly loved. Uh, she's going to continue to be truly, you know, this is sounding a little morbid here. We're, uh, <laughs> we are trying to honor somebody we love and care about that we're going to still love and care about, so, uh, and we're hoping so for a long, long time. You know, you just, she demonstrates that you need to be loving to your children because they get to pick the home. And we're sure that she's going to a safe, comfortable place and that they will continue to love and care for or answer to us. You know, several have mentioned already that we have room in our homes. We could also get on the Irene rotation schedule and just keep her for months at a time over here. So... We just want you to know that you're truly loved and cared about and, and will be missed. We could do this for a lot longer, but we're going to save all that for being able to just talk with Irene. I want to read something to you this morning from Proverbs. I'm going to be reading out of the Message Bible. It says, a, a truly good woman is hard to find and far, worth far more than diamonds. Her husband trusts her without reserve and never has reason to regret it. Never spiteful, she treats him generously all her life long. She shops around for the best yarns and cottons and enjoys knitting and sewing. She's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. She's up before dawn preparing breakfast for her family and organizing her day. She looks over a field and buys it, and then with money she put aside, plants a garden. First thing in the morning, she dresses for work, rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. She senses the work of, worth of her work and is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and hearth, diligent in homemaking. She's quick to assist anyone in need, reaches out to help the poor. She doesn't worry about her family when it snows. Their winter clothes are all mended and ready to wear. She makes her own clothing and dresses and colorful linens and silks. Her husband is greatly respected when he deliberates with the city fathers. She designs gowns and sells them, brings the sweaters she knits to dress shops. Her clothes are well made and elegant. 
She always faces tomorrow with a smile. When she speaks, she has something worthwhile to say. She always says it kindly. She keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. Her children respect her and bless her. Her husband joins in with words of praise. Many women have done wonderful things, but you've outclassed them all. Charm can mislead and beauty soon fades. The woman to be admired and praised is a woman who lives in the fear of God. Give her everything she deserves. Fill her life with praises. You know, there's a lot of women who say, I can't be like that woman. There's a lot of men who say, my wife cannot be like that woman. Christian women today have a hate-love relationship with Proverbs. You know, sometimes you're encouraged, sometimes you're discouraged, maybe a little, maybe a little of both. I want to make five points this morning and we'll be through. Who is the woman of Proverbs 31? For single men looking for an honorable, honorable wife, it's a sketch, a sketch of a godly woman. The virtuous woman in the Bible isn't really a woman at all. She's intended to be the type for all godly women to follow, but not held up as someone every woman must fall short of. When you look at the virtuous woman in your Bible, you do so as an example. You're holding her up as an ideal, not in reality. And that's dangerous because you'll always fall short of an ideal. The first thing we need to know about her is she isn't real. But she is ideal, and she's included in the scriptures to encourage and inspire. But she isn't a real woman doing all those things 24 hours a day with smiles every moment she wakes up. That's the first thing you need to know. Number two, what's her purpose? I believe the proverb is told to a son by a mother who wanted him to appreciate a godly wife. To teach her son to love with grace and not to highlight her shortcomings. The Proverbs 31 woman decided, describes a seasoned woman. I was trying to think of, a, of another word se besides seasoned and I, well, I could come up with maybe battle scars. A lot of life experience. It doesn't show in English, but this is written as a poem. In the Hebrew language, it's written as a poem that's easily learned and easily memorized. And therefore, that poem can stay in your mind and it can stay on your heart. Number three, what are her values? I think when you look at this woman, if you just read it out of, I read it out of three or four translations, and you read it, it's daunting to feel that you have to measure up to this woman. She's a blessing to her husband and to her children. She's respected in the city. city. She's well thought of with everyone that she interacts with. It's interesting, when you read through the scriptures, her appearance is never mentioned. But her godly heart is all over the page. The wise mama told her son what to look for, what really matters in a wife, and to find out things. I think she was looking at things from an eternal standpoint. The woman's busy with her hands and her minds. Far from the idle caricature of modern that modern feminism paints. She was not afraid to get her hands dirty while being strong. The woman was one who knew 
where true, uh, true values were, and she invested in those true values. What was her main role? Well, I'm not sure that it was all about buying and selling. I mean, I, I've never, never met a woman in my life that did all these things. I, I had a mother who was pretty diligent, but she fell far short of this. I've never known a woman to get up every day with a smile on her face. It's just not there. So again, this is the ideal that we're to, to, to look for. It's, it's a little bit like Hebrews chapter 11. When you read of those men and women of faith, that, that's mountain peak moments in their life. If you look at, the, at, at um, Noah, what happened to him right after the flood? He, built a, he grew a vineyard and got drunk. That's not taking away from Noah. Abraham was this, this great person in history. And what did he do? Well, in Genesis 22, he offered his son Isaac. He was ready to do so, the scripture said, and he reckoned God could raise him from the dead, and figuratively he did. But Abraham, when he met with the king, was asked, who is this? And she, he said, well, she's my sister. He's afraid. So ideals are important to us. The woman in, in Proverbs prized, I believe, relationship over accomplishment. Maybe she tried to live like, live a Martha life with a merry heart. I don't know. And then what are some outstanding virtues? I know you didn't think I could move this fast, did you? So many times, as men and women, <clears throat> when we look at where we are in life, we lament that we're not somewhere else right now. When you read the Proverbs 31, she's all about becoming. It takes time to mature in the Lord and cultivate those values in life. Can you imagine a young bride reading that? And feeling, well, tomorrow I need to do that. I would say that she has three outstanding things. Number one, she embraces God's grace. Number two, she bears God's image well. And number three, she's fulfilling God's call in her life. If you remember nothing else about this woman, remember that it's the virtuous woman in the Bible, a beautiful example of what woman can become. Jesus reflected image-bearing children of God. Irene, you've been such an example. You eagerly took all, on all the roles that have been talked about. I, Pat did a lot of research. Thank you, Pat, for putting a lot of this together. I talked to people. Everyone that I talked to held you up as an example. And one of the things they said, she's a great teacher. She spent a lot of time in classes. She was always prepared for those little munchkins when they came through the door. You're eager to be involved in the needs of the body. Here in Tulare, taking food to people who needed it. Who will be the next Proverbs 31 woman? Are we up to it? Are you ready to be a modern day virtuous woman? If so, it will make it will be made up of, of women who, like you, love God. As Larry said, they love their families. It's made up of women who love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. And their, their goal in life is to please Jesus. It's a group 
maybe even an army that will that will change the world one generation one marriage one child at a time Thank you, Irene, for being here, for me getting a chance to even take in a little bit of those 61 years that you spent here. But people notice, and Jesus notices. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, Irene will tell you it, wasn't, it isn't always easy. But the one thing that everyone said that I talked to about her is she's faithful. That's all God asks. He's not asking any woman to be this, these things that I read. Those are ideals. Those are things to shoot for. That, that tells us how far we can go. The, the sky's the limit. These are, these are all possibilities. But what God wants most from a woman is her heart. If you're here today and you're not a child of God, woman, man, child, you know what God would have you do. We'll assist you in becoming a child of God today if you'll come while we stand and sing. Though my everlasting portion more than friends or life to me all the 